Uh, the second keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Frank Mitloner, and to introduce him, we have Ms. Joyce Parslow from Canada Beef. Take it away. Hello all and a hearty welcome from Canada Beef. We're glad that you could come out to Saskatchewan Farm and Food Cares Conference today on cultivating trust. Canada Beef represents the over 60,000 beef farmers and ranchers right across the country in each and every province. And Canada Beef offers great sound information and facts about nutrition when it comes to beef, as well as environmental impacts when it comes to raising beef cattle in the Canadian context, as well as information on buying and cooking beef, and of course, loads of recipes. I'm Joyce Parslow, and I've been with Canada Beef for many years now. And if there's one thing I've learned about beef, this is one fascinating food. I have not been bored one day of this job in my 20 years here. So without further ado, I'm here to introduce Dr. Frank Mitloner. Now I have been a groupie, a sound silent stalker of Frank Mitloner for several years now. He's known as the greenhouse gas guru on Twitter and that's um, at GHG guru. And um, I've always been so impressed about how Frank can take very complex scientific information and distill it down into consumable and interesting facts for the public. He's not only a brilliant person at science, he's also a brilliant person at communication. And that's one thing the world could really use more of right now. So he has a pretty in-depth bio I have here. So I'm just gonna read that to you because I wanna make sure I get it right. So Dr. Mitloner is, uh, conducts research that's directly relevant to understanding and mitigating the emissions from livestock operations. And he has served as the chairman of um, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization Partnership Project to benchmark the environmental footprint of livestock production. He is a professor of air quality specialist in corporate extension in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Davis. And he's also served on the United States President's Council of Advisors in Tech Science and Technology. So today, Dr. Mitloner is going to be speaking on the path to climate neutrality for animal agriculture. I'm so honored in to introduce you all to Dr. Mitloner. And um, Dr. Mitloner, I want to personally thank you for your fine work and for your presentation today. Well, thank you very much. What an introduction. I'm, I'm very humble, humbled and uh, feel honored to uh, talk to you today. Um, greetings from California to all of you. I wish we could be uh, there together, Saskatchewan. Um, but anyhow, this will have to do for a while. I guess next year we can change this, hopefully. Um, so I will talk to you about methane today and not only about methane, but mainly about methane. And um, it might sound like a pretty uh, dry and maybe very technical issue, but you know what? I think this is one of the most important one that's, um, uh, that's happening on the environmental side of animal agriculture. Methane, in my opinion, is the Achilles heel of animal agriculture. And I've been in this field for quite a while now. I've been here in Davis since 2002, and California has always been the, the, the place where environmental issues around livestock happen first. So I would share what I know with you today. Rethinking methane, the path to climate neutrality. Before I get started any further, I want to make sure that everybody is clear. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas. I'm in no way belittling its importance, okay? but I will provide some uh, nuance around this gas and uh, why we need to understand it in the way that it actually affects the climate. Because the way that methane and other greenhouse gases are sometimes characterized, are not with respect to how they affect the climate, even though that's what it's all about, how greenhouse gases affect the climate. So if you want a little recap of what I'm talking about here today, then this video here called Rethinking Methane will, I think, do a fine job. It's a five minute video that the CLEAR Center that I'm the director of has put together maybe two months ago. And uh, again, it's five minutes. It's rather non-technical and easy to share. It's on YouTube, so you find it very easily. YouTube, Rethinking Methane, and Bob's your uncle. Um, some parts of my presentation have a little bit of a US spin, and I hope you apologize that. Um, 
but I want to give you an idea as to uh, where we stand right now um, here in North America and in the US in particular, and, um, and also where livestock globally stands. If you look at all greenhouse gases in the world caused by human activity, they amount to a number which is 49 gigatons, 49, almost 50 gigatons. That's a large number, okay? And of the five, almost 50 gigatons uh, produced by humans, uh, the US is responsible for a total of 12% of the total. That's all sources in the United States contributing to 12% of all greenhouse gases in the world. And uh, as you can see here, these three uh, pieces of the pie, one in blue, one in purple, one in gray, these are the US uh, contributions to greenhouse gases. The blue is the largest uh, piece of the pie uh, from, from US contributions, and that's fossil fuel related industries. Uh, you see there in purple, that's animal agriculture and animal source foods, and in gray, that's plant agriculture and plant source foods. So the US total uh, agricultural production and consumption of foods uh, amounts to approximately 1% of total greenhouse gases in the world. Why am I showing this slide? I'm showing this slide because sometimes when reading the media, we, uh, we, we seem to get the impression that what we eat makes all the difference in the world with respect to total contribution to greenhouse gases. And uh, oftentimes one gets the impression also that other sources can be uh, almost relaxed uh, upon and toward, and that is simply not the case. The EPA in the United States is very clear about who the main sectors of greenhouse gases are, namely transportation, that's cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, power production and use, and they say industry, and they mean mainly the cement industry. These three, transportation, energy generation, and industry, combined are responsible for over 80%, 80 that is, of greenhouse gases in the United States. All of agriculture combined is responsible for 9%. This is uh, depicted with a cow, but this is not animal agriculture, this is all agriculture. According to the EPA, animal agriculture alone, that's all species, beef, dairy, swine, and so on, small ruminants, all of those combined is 3.9%, okay? Let's call that 4%. Um, and why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because um, sometimes uh, you get under the impression that uh, what livestock produces is uh, more important than anything else uh, produced, not just here in the United States, but also in Canada and European countries and so on. And that is a very dangerous narrative. Why is it dangerous? It's dangerous because it sidetracks us of the 800 pound gorilla, which is the use of fossil fuel, like it or not, it is the 800 pound gorilla. So. Does livestock have a contribution? Yes, it does. We know what the contribution is here in the United States. We know what it is in Canada. We know what it is in European countries. We know what it is in Australia, New Zealand, and in many developing countries. Um, and I think it's important that we uh, quantify those contributions of livestock and further reduce them. But it's also very important to be fair about it and, um, and make meaningful steps Part of that is the narrative that I'm about to share with you, namely the narrative around the greenhouse gas methane. First of all, what are greenhouse gases? So these little balls in the air here are greenhouse gas molecules. Okay, And this large yellow one here, that's the sun radiating down solar beams to the surface of the Earth. Normally, that solar radiation would be reflected back into space if there weren't these greenhouse gases. Gases such as CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, they function pretty much like a blanket that you put over our atmosphere, trapping the heat from the sun close to our Earth surface. So this blanket here, uh, consisting of greenhouse gases, is actually very important. Without greenhouse gases, life on Earth would not be possible. It would be too cold here, okay? So we need greenhouse gases. The problem is we now have too many of those. That means the blanket is getting too thick. And anything that contributes to the emissions of CO2, carbon dioxide, or methane, or nitrous oxide, is under the gun right now, particularly fossil fuels. And uh, in that case, fossil fuels are really the main culprit by far, as any um, serious climate scientist in the world would attest to. But some of the people who are anti-livestock will tell you, no, 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 it's methane, and particularly methane from livestock, that's a huge um, contributor to a warming planet. And so that is what I will talk about now. 
When we look at greenhouse gases, such as CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, depicted on the left, then they are oftentimes compared to one another with respect to a unit called the global warming potential, GWP 100, global warming potential. I will refer to that a lot throughout my talk. The global warming potential compares methane and nitrous oxide to CO2. So if something, let's say a feedlot or so, produces 100 tons of methane, then all you need to do is multiply the 100 tons from that feedlot times 28, because, met because methane is 28 times more potent than CO2. And then you have the so-called CO2 equivalent of those 100 tons of methane. Okay, So 100 tons of methane produced by a feedlot times 28 arrives at the CO2 equivalent amount of greenhouse gas for that 100 tons of methane. Same is true for nitrous oxide. If something produces 50 tons of nitrous oxide, all you need to do is multiply 50 times the factor 265, and then you get the CO2 equivalent amount of greenhouse gases. Now, this has been used, this global warming potential, since, since 1990. So almost 30 years now. And originally it was designed to be a relatively easy way of comparing different sectors of society and different services products to one another. However, you will see that um, that might still be a way of looking at methane under a scenario where methane is increasing in a country like Canada. But if methane from a source like cattle, for example, is stable or even decreasing, then this global warming potential 100 GWP 100 will not do the job. In fact, it will give us wrong information. So this year is the global methane budget. This is the global methane budget. So these are all the sources of methane on the left side, including fossil fuel production and use, agriculture and waste, biomass burning, wetlands, and so on. And all of them combined amount to a total of approximately 560, 560 teragrams of methane emitted, meaning that's the total amount human activity puts into the air, or all activities put into the air. As you see, even wetlands emit a lot of methane. And this is where the discussion oftentimes stops, namely at those contributing sources of methane. However, what's very important to point out is that methane is different from other greenhouse gases insofar that it's not just produced, meaning they are not just sources, but they are also sinks destroying it. And you see on the right side that these sinks amount to 550 teragrams. So in other words, you have to now subtract the 550 from the 560 to arrive at the net. And the net globally is 10, 10 teragrams of methane that are added to our atmosphere every year. And that's still too much and we want to reduce it, but it's obviously a massive difference whether we talk about 560 or about 10, okay? So what is this large arrow pointing down under the sink side of things here? It says sink from chemical reactions in the atmosphere. So here's what that is. Imagine this fist being a methane molecule in the atmosphere, let's say belched out by a cow. Sooner or later, and it takes about a decade, that methane molecule will meet a so-called radical. It's another molecule in the air. And that radical will take part of that methane away from it, namely the hydrogen. It will steal the hydrogen from the CH4 from the methane and destroy it. And that happens within 10 years. So this is why there is such a large arrow pointing down. There is this atmospheric process that destroys methane at a very high rate. So as a take home message of and from this slide, remember in the contrast, in sharp contrast to CO2 and nitrous oxide, which are only produced really and not really destroyed in the air, methane is destroyed. Almost at the same rate it's produced. The process of destruction is called hydroxyl oxidation. That's a mouthful, hydroxyl oxidation or in short oxidation. And that causes those greenhouse gases to really be different in another respect, namely in the lifespan they have. CO2 and nitrous oxide are so-called long lived climate pollutants. Once they're in the atmosphere, they stay there pretty much forever. Anytime that you have ever driven a car, 
every time that you have ever burned fossil fuel, oil, coal, and gas, every time your parents have done it, and every time your grandparents have done it, and every time your grand-grandparents have done it, all the resulting CO2 is still in the atmosphere. It accumulates in the atmosphere, and it stays there for a thousand years. Okay, That's why CO2 is such a big deal. Nitrous oxide also has a long lifespan, but methane, as I just showed you, does not. After 10 years, that methane, that, let's say a cow put out 10 years ago, is gone. It's gone. If you have constant herds of methane, let's say a constant herd of cattle, then the amount of methane produced by those cattle and the amount of methane destroyed even each other out. That means a constant herd, and now listen carefully, a constant herd does not add additional methane to the atmosphere. A constant herd does not add additional warming to the atmosphere. A growing herd would, and that would be a problem. A constant herd does not. And if somehow you manage to reduce methane through various means, and that's possible, then you can actually pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And that gets really exciting, as you will see in a few minutes. So remember from this slide, methane is different from other greenhouse gases in so far that it's not just produced, but also destroyed almost at equal rates. It's a short-lived climate pollutant with a lifespan of a decade. Now comes a very important slide. It explains where methane, which is CH4, gets its carbon from. Carbon is C, and the carbon from methane originates really in the atmosphere. I take you back to your uh, school days where you learned what well, plants need to grow. Plants need sunlight, they need water, and they need a carbon source. And that carbon source is CO2 from the atmosphere. That CO2 goes into the plants and the plants use that carbon, that CO2 carbon, in order to produce carbohydrates such as cellulose and, and or starch, depending upon whatever plant that is. So these carbohydrates are then um, eaten by, let's say this cow there, the cow eats those carbohydrates, let's say the cellulose, and then she converts a small portion of those carbohydrates into methane. And this process is called enteric emissions, namely the process by which this is happening in the room and that methane is then belched out. Some more methane is coming off her manure. So, but uh, regardless of where that methane comes from, whether it comes from the front end or from the manure, uh, that methane stays in the atmosphere for 10 years, then meets this radical in the air. The radical destroys the CH4 steals the hydrogen, the H, from the methane, and converts that methane back into CO2. Now, you might ask me, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because methane has a lifespan of 10 years, CO2 has one of 1,000 years. You just said it, so why is that good? It's not a question of whether that's good or bad. It's a question of explaining where that carbon of the methane, where that carbon comes from. It originates from atmospheric CO2, it's recycled carbon. It's not, and that's important, it is not new carbon added to the atmosphere. Hence, it does not cause additional, additional warming. As long as you have constant herds, the amount of methane produced and the amount of methane destroyed are in balance. So that methane then, that results of this hydroxyl oxidation process is added back to our, to our atmospheric pool from which plants then can take new CO2 for photosynthesis. So this is called the biological or biogenic carbon cycle. And as you can see in a minute, it's very different from greenhouse gases that stem from, let's say, fossil fuels. What are fossil fuels? Oil, coal, gas. Form a plant and animal material from a long, long time ago, which accumulated um, of course, over centuries, over millennia, and eventually uh, those plants and animals died, they decayed, they fossilized, and then they got stored in the ground. And over the last 70 years, seven zero, we have taken about half of all that carbon that was stored in the ground from very, very long uh, accumulation periods. We have taken half of that out of the ground. And what did we do with it? We burned it. So where is that carbon now? It's no longer down there. It's now up there in the atmosphere. And every time the sun hits those molecules, they heat up. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the main reason why climate scientists will say and do say we need to uh, work on fossil fuels and reduction of fossil fuels if we are serious about curbing climate change. And while we all understand that, that fossil fuels are the main uh, driver of carbon emissions to our atmosphere, um, those people who have an issue with livestock uh, will say, no, 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 it's livestock, you know, forget everything else, uh, let's focus on what we eat. I, I think, I personally think that this is a very dangerous distraction, a very dangerous distraction because well over 80% of emissions, greenhouse gas emissions stem from fossil fuel use and by focusing on what we eat, we are sidetracking of the big price of the 800 pound gorilla. In summary, on the fossil fuel side, you have carbon that was stored in the ground for a long time. We unlocked it by drilling or digging it out. We have put that carbon into the atmosphere. And now we have all this ancient carbon in the atmosphere and it adds up, it's accumulate, it, it, it accumulates, so it's accumulative gas. It's also referred to as a stock gas because every time we take it out of the ground, we put it into the air, we add to the existing stock. That's why CO2 is called a stock gas. On the cow side of things, on the livestock side of things, you have CO2 going into the plants. The plants take that carbon. Some of it is used for above ground. Some of it is used for below ground usage. Um, the below ground usage is oftentimes sequestered uh, that's referred to as carbon sequestration, meaning a lot of the carbon that was in the air is going into the ground and stored there. Um, the animal, of course, eats above ground vegetation, belches out some methane, some more comes from the manure, and then that's converted back into CO2, uh, adding to the uh, atmospheric pool. So please understand, in summary of this slide, the fossil fuel greenhouse gas issues are a one-way street of either carbon in the form of you know, uh, oil, coal, and gas carbon being converted into CO2 or methane uh, to that extent, uh, which also comes from the ground when we, for example, uh, do fracking. So that's a one-way street, whereas the cow's carbon cycle is not a one-way street, but a cyclical event. So that's a very different story. That's one of the reasons why nobody should compare cows versus cows. It's an unfair and it's a, it's a erroneous comparison that is uh, not really leading us to a path for solutions. And I think we should all agree that's what we're after. I will now explain in a couple of slides something that's quite technical, but I think it's very important to understand. First, the biggest difference between a long-lived climate pollutant, such as CO2, versus a short-lived climate pollutant, such as methane. Imagine you drive to work on Monday, the day one, you put CO2 into the atmosphere. On Tuesday, you drive the same distance, you put additional new CO2 into the atmosphere, which is now on top of what you put out on Monday, which is still there. On Wednesday, you drive again, and that Wednesday is on top of the Tuesday and the Monday emissions and so on. And so every time you burn fossil fuel, you add additional carbon to the atmosphere. That's what that slide shows. And you add to the existing stock of what you had already put into the atmosphere before, or what your parents or your grandparents or your grand grandparents put into the air. So CO2 is a stock gas. It accumulates in the atmosphere. Methane is not a stock gas. So if you, let's say, have a cattle herd, then what your cattle emit today is not additional to what they added uh, a year ago, but it's replacing it. So methane is referred to as a flow gas. So if you, let's say, have a herd of cattle and you've had it for 50 years, then only the first 10 years of your ranch's existence did you add new additional methane to the atmosphere. After the first 10 years, the amount of methane released by your animals and the amount of methane destroyed by hydroxyl oxidation were in balance. Again, constant cattle herds do not add new additional methane, hence new additional warming. So methane is not a stock gas. Methane is a flow gas. It does not accumulate in the atmosphere. Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because GWP100, the unit that had been used up until now, really, by by so many, is treating methane as if it were a stock gas, as if it were accumulating in the atmosphere like CO2 does, even though it does not. 
obviously it's very important to know that a certain gas is not just produced but also destroyed by natural processes and GWP 100 does not take that into consideration it only takes the production but not the destruction into consideration if you want to know more about this, which I hope you will, um, there are colleagues from Australia, from New Zealand, and of course we here in California too, uh, who put out a lot of uh, blogs and so forth uh, on this topic, but also there are a sizable numbers now of uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications uh, published in Nature and Science and so on, on the topic of why we have been treating methane incorrectly, particularly biogenic methane from livestock. I will give you three scenarios now to exemplify why the way that methane has been quantified until recently is in, inappropriate. Imagine three scenarios. The, all three scenarios are depicted over a 30 year lifespan on the X axis here. And so the first one is a scenario by which we increase methane by 35%. For example, if you have a certain region and you have a million cattle there, now you're increasing your herd size drastically over 30 years, you might have a 35% increase in methane. The second scenario will be one by which we hold methane relatively stable over 30 years, a slight reduction of 10%. And a strong reduction of methane over 35% is depicted in the bottom here. Again, over 30 years, a strong reduction of 35%. What would these three scenarios, an increase, stable, and a decrease, scenario for methane, what would they look like when depicted with a GWP 100? GWP 100, the way that methane is quantified currently by most bodies in the world, will predict that all three scenarios, the increasing methane, the stable methane, and the decreasing methane, all lead to strong increases in CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases. Even the stable and the decreasing amount of methane are predicted to strongly increase greenhouse gases uh, as measured as CO2, e, CO2 equivalent. And we know that's not true because methane is not just produced but also destroyed. So this GWP100 clearly depicts methane as if it were a stock gas and not a flow gas. So now colleagues from Oxford University in the UK acknowledged this mistake and said, we need to look at how methane changes over time, whether it increases, decreases, or stays stable over time. And we need to look at the actual warming impact of that methane, because GWP100 doesn't do that. It only looks into a conversion to CO2E, CO2 equivalent units. So this new unit that these Oxford colleagues uh, proposed, GWP star, predicts the following. If you increase methane by 35%, then whatever GWP 100 predicted holds true, namely a strong reduction, a strong increase in the warming equivalent related to that increase in methane. We do not want to increase methane, period. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas. We do not want to increase it. But what if we keep our livestock herd stable or slightly reduce uh, the amount of methane coming from a livestock herd? Then you see here that there is nothing blue north of the, the x-axis, meaning a stable or slightly reducing herd will not contribute to additional warming, will not contribute to additional warming. In fact, because there's a slight reduction over 30 years here, you see that the warming equivalents are south of the x-axis, meaning there's a small negative warming. And negative warming is nothing other than cooling. Look what happens here at the bottom. A strong reduction of methane by 35% leads to a strong decrease in warming, meaning negative warming. And again, negative warming is nothing other than cooling. So now I know there are people saying, well, how can that be? I cannot imagine how that could possibly happen. How could a cattle herd cool the planet? So first of all, it's not a cattle herd cooling the planet. It's a reduction of methane cooling the planet, okay? When you reduce methane, you pull carbon out of the atmosphere. I give you an analogy. There are many governments now that incentivizes farmers to grow trees on their farm. Why would they do such a thing? They do that because they know 
that the trees will take on CO2 during photosynthesis, meaning these trees will pull carbon out of the atmosphere. That's a good thing, right? They do that also because by reducing that CO2 from the atmosphere, you are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. That has a net negative on warming. Namely, it causes negative warming, which is cooling. The same is true for methane, but even more so. If we reduce methane, we have a strong negative warming, and that means a cooling effect. And the next slide will show again very nicely the difference between CO2 versus methane under rising constant and decreasing emission scenarios. So imagine a power plant increasing the amount of power produced over time and therefore the amount of CO2 going to the air. And then we might have a feedlot that's growing over, let's say 20, 30 years, uh, producing more methane with larger number of animals. Uh, what would these two emission sources, the power plant and the increasing uh, cattle rarity, what would they do to warming? The power plant would lead to an exponential increase in warming from CO2 because it's a cumulative gas and that causes uh, exponential increases in warming when you increase the, the source. If you linearly increase the amount of methane produced, then that source would also lead to a linear increase in the warming associated with that methane increase. If you look at constant emissions, let's say that power plant, that same power plant now running at constant level, um, producing a constant amount of CO2, then that would still lead to increasing amount of warming associated with that CO2 because it's a cumulative stock gas. So what we put out today is on top of what we put out yesterday and the day before and so on. That's why it still goes up. But look what the constant cattle herd, let's say, does that emits a constant amount of methane. It leads to constant warming, no additional warming. Why am I saying that? Why is that a big deal? It's a big deal because that's what it's about, warming. The Paris Climate Accord is not about CO2 equivalents. It's about keeping the warming below one and a half degrees centigrade. It's the warming that we care about. So if a constant herd does not add additional carbon to the atmosphere, and hence not additional warming to the atmosphere, then this is obviously something not just all farmers should know, but everybody should know. But it's even more important to understand methane because once we reduce it, amazing things happen. Here you see a scenario by which both CO2 and methane uh, fall over time. If you reduce methane, let's say you shut down that power plant, then even though you've shut it down, the warming associated with that power plant that's now shut down still accumulates over time because, um, because even though you decrease over time, you still add whatever you decrease still to the existing amount you put out before. Only at the time that you put CO2 emissions at zero, you lead to a zero increase in the related warming. That's what it takes. You have to go to net zero in CO2 in order to just plateau the warming that's associated with it. Sometimes people ask me, is methane really a super pollutant? And I say, no, methane is not a super pollutant. Methane is a super opportunity. CO2 is a super pollutant. And this is why it's a super pollutant. Because even when we decrease it, we still get an increase of warming. We have to shut down CO2 altogether, down to zero, in order for it to stop contributing to warming. But look what happens when we decrease warming over time. When we decrease warming, we have an instantaneous cooling effect, an instantaneous cooling effect. So the next question I might get from you is, is that even possible that we can decrease methane at these rates? Well, and the answer is yes, that is possible. Not just is it possible, it's already happening. Here in California, we have a new law. Uh, it's called thir SB 1383, and it mandates a 40% reduction of methane, 40, 40% reduction of methane to be achieved by the year 2030. When that law was passed a few years back, our farmers went wild, thinking never can we achieve a 40% reduction. The state did something really smart. Our legislature decided not to use the cane approach of rules and regulations and fines, but instead use the carrot approach. The carrot approach meant incentivizing methane reductions financially, partnering with the livestock, with the dairy industry to get reductions done. 
The state poured in half a billion dollars to reduce methane. And the dairy and other industries partnered with the state. And, for example, on the side of, of our dairy industry, which in California is very strong, we produce 20% of all U.S. milk, many dairies went in and covered their lagoons where the manure is stored. And instead of just releasing that biogas to the atmosphere, now that gas is captured, as you can see here, bulging out of this plastic. And the biogas that's now collected is not just burned, like it did and like it was in the past. But now that biogas is captured and converted into fuels for vehicles called renewable natural gas. So now, not just do we prevent the emissions of gases from the lagoon into the atmosphere, that's the one whammy, but we are displacing diesel that normally would have been used by the semi trucks with renewable natural gas. And those farmers who do that, who cover their lagoon and convert the biogas into renewable natural gas will get very significant low carbon fuel standard credits, rim credits and others, which are a very big deal actually. Also, uh, there were hundreds of millions of dollars that went into uh, capital cost, uh, cost sharing. Uh, with our industries. And as a result, we are pulling 2.2 million metric tons of methane out of the atmosphere, equating to a 25% reduction of methane that's already achieved. I told you the goal in California is 40% reduction. We are already halfway there, over halfway there, 25 of the 40. So that is truly astounding. And if I might remind you of what that means to warming and or cooling, that's what it means. We are reducing methane strongly, and that has a strong impact on negative warming, which is a cooling effect. And because we are reducing that methane from our atmosphere, leading to a cooling effect on the methane side, that cooling can counteract the warming caused by nitrous oxide and CO2. Overall, that can lead to a situation, and it does, where we are moving toward climate neutrality with our dairy and livestock sector. In a few years, our dairy and livestock sector will not add to additional warming. But in fact, if the cooling is strong enough, we could actually be a solution provider and uh, counteract some of the fossil fuel related emissions coming from other sectors. Obviously a total change in narrative. This is not some kind of greenwashing or so, this is real. This is real. What people need to understand is why methane is different. Methane is indeed a super opportunity, and I think you should view it as such. I will now move into a topic called the 2050 challenge, and uh, students I teach here at UC Davis get really excited about that. What is the 2050 challenge? Um, it's depicted on this slide on the x-axis, you see the year 1750 to 2050, hence the name 2050 challenge. And on the z-axis, the total number of people in the world. I just turned 50 last year when I was a little boy, we were here at 3 billion people. Today we are at 7.8 billion, and by the time I'm an old man, we'll be at 9.5 billion. Or in other words, throughout my lifetime and yours, human population on our planet will have tripled. We'll have three times more people to feed. And as you can see here, developed countries in orange are kind of plateauing, whereas developing and emerging countries are exploding, particularly because of increasing life expectancies in these countries. This slide here shows the world and a circle over South Southeast Asia. And that circle contains more people in it than the rest of the world combined. More people live inside the circle than outside the circle. But while Asia is increasing human population by approximately 40%, Africa is even worse, almost 50%. The Americas are quite stable. So the 2050 challenge will not hit us here in the Americas. Uh, and Europe is slightly shrinking or predicted to slightly shrink. So it's part of Asia and particularly Africa that is of major concern. Those areas here in red are countries that will double their population every decade between now and 2050, double the population every decade. And not just is this population increase troublesome, but also 
um, the productivity rates of uh, food production are troublesome because the efficiencies are dismal. The efficiencies of food production are dismal. And I don't want anybody here listening to this think that I'm pointing fingers saying we are doing things so well here and look at the rest of the world, uh, which is failing. That is not at all my intent, but my intent is to point out that there are some hotspots in the world and that we need to collaborate and assist those places in order to prevent some major global conflicts and disruptions of the food supply in the decades to come. While we have this increase in human population, we have a situation where our food producing base is quite limited. What you see here in color are the only areas in the world where we can grow crops. That's it. Whether we have three, seven, nine or more people, billion people in the world, that's the only land we have available. Today, two thirds of all agricultural land in the, in the world, two thirds of all agricultural areas in the world are called marginal, meaning they cannot be used to grow crops there. Two thirds of all agricultural land in the world is marginal, which means the only thing that grows there is really non-human edible cellulose containing forages. And how do we use two thirds of all agricultural land in the world today? We use it with the only thing we can use it with, which is ruminant livestock. Without ruminants, we could not make use of two thirds of all agricultural land in the world today. What you see here in color is one third of all agricultural land in the world. And that's area that we can't really increase significantly. Here you can grow crops for humans and animals. That's it, that's how limited we are. So in other words, we have to become a whole lot better in what we do, how we grow food, if we really uh, are serious about uh, meeting the 2050 challenge. This slide here shows on the x-axis the amount of milk produced per cow per year, and on the y-axis the carbon footprint. And each dot here shows one country in the world. You see that there are many countries where they produce maybe 500 to 1,000 kilos of milk per cow per year. In Canada and the United States, we produce over 10,000 uh, kilos, over 10 tons of milk per cow per year. So it takes about 10 to 20 times the number of animals in a developing country um, to produce the same amount of milk as one cow uh, in developed countries. And so we really have to work together to change that because these herds on the left side here are enormous in size, enormous in size and not productive. So while we have 9 million dairy cows in the United States, India has 300 million. That's dairy and, and buffaloes, 300 million. And that is an enormous environmental footprint. And it's, it's caused because the individual animal is not very productive. On this slide here, also a dairy slide, you see regions throughout the world on the x-axis, carbon footprint on the y-axis. And again, you see North America has the lowest carbon footprint of milk production. There are certain areas sticking out. By the way, these are the same areas sticking out that also have the highest human population increase. These are the ones with the lowest food producing efficiencies and highest carbon footprints per unit of food produced in the world. There are four main things that you can do, that one can do to decrease environmental footprint of livestock. Improve reproduction, improve the veterinary care system, improve the genetics for crops and animals, and to feed more energy dense diets. These four factors have allowed us in most of the developed world to shrink the number of animals needed to produce whatever is demanded by our populations. And that has a direct effect on the environmental footprint. We have shrunk our herds and flocks drastically, and that had a major impact on the environmental footprint of livestock and poultry. Here you see what I think sustainability is all about. On the x-axis, you see the years. You see the inputs, farm inputs in uh, the United States, which have been pretty stable over the last few decades, but the outputs have gone rocket, skyrocket high. This is really what it means to do more with less, maybe not with less, but do much more with pretty much the same, okay? This is really what we need to do globally. We have no choice, we have no choice in the matter. I mean, unless you wanna say we have to limit human population development uh, and tell the, th the third world um, how they should grow. If you're not willing to do that, then we really have to think about how we get this food to them and how we assist them producing what they need. 
just a few really quick slides here. On the, in the US, we, we used to have 25 million dairy cows back in 1950. Today, we have 9 million, so much fewer. But with this much smaller herd here, we are producing 60% more milk, meaning the glass, the carbon footprint of a glass of milk has shrunk by two thirds. On the beef side, we used to have 140 million beef cattle. Today, we have 90 million, so much fewer beef cattle, but we are producing the same amount of beef today. We have shrunk, and you see it on this slide here, the number of animals slaughtered for beef pretty drastically, but we've increased beef production drastically as well. We're producing 18% one eight of the world's beef with 8% of the world's beef herd. So that is really impressive. And you in Canada do the same thing. I mean, not the same numbers, but uh, it's the same trend overall. So I will not go into all these details here. Really briefly, sometimes people say we need to change what we eat. We eat way too much beef, I hear often. On this slide here, you see the amount of animal source foods eaten between 1909 versus pretty much today. What you see here is beef has not really changed. We are still eating the same amount of beef per capita as we did uh, over 100 years ago. Total red meat has actually gone down in the US. What's interesting is total meat has gone up pretty drastically. But what this is, is not beef. It is chicken. Chicken has gone up 500% between 1909 and today. So it is not really true that we are eating more red meat. It's also not true what some people say, namely that we eat way too much protein, way too much meat. In the United States in 2016, uh, we actually ate 5.8 ounces of meat and poultry per day. Recommended by the dietary guidelines was that we should eat 5.5 ounces. So we actually ate 5.8, we were recommended to eat 5.5. I don't wanna bore you with all the details here, but really briefly on the left side of the slide here, you see males in different age groups on the x-axis. On the right side, females in different age groups. And these blue bars here show the recommended range that let's say a kid one to three years of age should consume protein. And this orange dot shows how much these age groups actually eat. So blue is the range and the orange dot is the actual consumed protein. You see here on the male side, there are three male groups, age groups, that exceed the recommended rates of protein. None of the other male or female groups exceed the recommended range. So I hear this often, but uh, the data in this case, the NHANES data, uh, which are reputable data, do not confirm these assertions. Sometimes we hear we need to all become vegans or vegetarians, and that, that would be a, a huge movement the economist called 2019, the year of the vegans. Uh, let's take a look at how that, you know, whether that's true. And first of all, what that would do. Can we eat our way out of climate change? Some scientists have looked at what it would take or what the benefit would be from an omnivore to go to a vegan for one year. It would amount to a savings of 0.8 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions, 0.8 tons. Contrast that to a single flight from Canada or the United States to Europe, which per passenger amounts to 1.6 tons. So going vegan for one year has half the impact as what one transatlantic flight causes per passenger. If the entire United States with 330 million US citizens were to go meatless Monday, we would reduce our carbon footprint by 0.3%. If the entire country were to go vegan, 330 million people go vegan, we would reduce the carbon footprint of the US by 2.6%. Can we eat our way out of climate change? The answer is definitely not. If we really want to do something about climate change, we have to think about carbon emissions from fossil fuels, period. So how about veganism? The Vegan Society of the United States is pretty disgruntled these, way, these days. And the reason for this is because they cannot figure out the reason for the following. This here is from the Vegan Society of the United States. It shows that 84% of vegetarians and vegans in this country, in the United States, and I'm sure the numbers are the same in Canada, 84% of vegetarians and vegans abandon their diet after one year. Just so that this is clear, for every one active vegan vegetarian in the United States, there are five former vegetarians and vegans. Meaning this is certainly not a diet form that is highly sustainable, highly likable, 
I don't know why people abandon it, whether it's not, whether they are lacking nutrients or taste, but they abandon it at high rates. So we still have a very dismal amount of, of, of vegans in this country, even though they are depicted in much of the media as um, belonging to a major, major movement. That major movement is largely fictional. After all the hype that we heard in the media about plant-based diets, like the Impossible Burger, Beyond Meat, and so on, all of these plant-based alternatives combined make up 0.6%, 0.6% of total meat sales. 0.6% of total meat sales are these plant-based alternatives. I find that very interesting, to be honest. If you want to know what the greatest environmental uh, issue is that we have with our food system, it is depicted on this slide. Here you see a US family in front of all the waste that's not eaten. Food waste and food losses amount to 40%, 40 40% of all the food produced, not just in the US, also in Canada and all European countries. In fact, all over the world, even in African countries that are food insecure, the number for their food losses amount to 40% as well. Clearly one of the issues where we can all do better and we must, in, in my opinion. With that, I close uh, my uh, Twitter handle is GHG Guru. It was mentioned initially. Um, my center, the Clear Center is also on Twitter. Uh, we have a blog that's depicted here or uh, the address is. And uh, we are of course uh, also on the internet here, clear.ucdavis.edu is our web address. And we have a lot of interesting content uh, including blogs and explainers and, and so forth. So please come and join us and, uh, and please ask me questions. I'm very happy to entertain anyone, any question that you might have. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. That was an excellent presentation. And I, I actually took a ton of notes. I, I feel like I was back in one of my classes in university uh, so I can uh, use this in some of my presentations going forward. Uh, just a, a few quick questions off the cuff. Um, the emissions that you mentioned for, and I think it was 9% in the United States, and I think it's somewhat the same in Canada. Um, when you actually, and, and say I start my tractor up and it starts burning some diesel fuel, is that considered fossil fuel emissions or is that considered agriculture emissions? That's largely part of, of the agricultural emissions. Yes. Okay, so that's the classification because I know that that would make a little bit of a difference and I know there's different professors up here that uh, have compared the net greenhouse gas emissions using different um, farming techniques. And uh, I know they always say it's net with um, they include all the fossil fuels and, and synthetic fertilizers. And, and yeah, the difference is you uh, can look at direct emissions only, that's enteric emissions and manure emissions, and that's by far the majority of greenhouse gases from livestock. Uh, or you can look at life cycle emissions, and in that case, you would look at everything, soil, plants, fertilizer, herbicides, animals, right. uh, transport of goods to uh, processing distribution centers and so on, all the way until we put it in our mouths. And that's referred to as life cycle emissions. Right. So we have both data. We have the EPA data, which are direct emissions, and we have individual LCA, life cycle assessment is, uh, um, numbers established for all livestock and poultry species. We have those, and farmers were supportive of getting those numbers. We have them now. Mm -hmm. And the different farming sectors have, um, have promised further reductions. And this to me is very important. They haven't been sitting on their, on, their, on their butts and said, you know, yeah, we might contribute something, but it's not a big deal. But they said, yeah, it might not be as much as fossil fuel users, um, but we are contributors and we are willing to further reduce. And that to me is a very important part of the narrative. So uh, one of our uh, first uh, questions comes from Cassie. Uh, just with a quick internet search, many people can be misled by the information involving greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the agriculture community comparing to other emissions like say cows versus commercial factories. How do we overcome some of these articles to display at a ground level of understanding to others to see that the agriculture community does not produce uh, greenhouse gases in such a huge manner as what's sometimes being perceived in the media. 
So first of all, I think it's really important to acknowledge that every sector of society emits greenhouse gases, and that includes our food producing sector. And it includes, of course, animal agriculture. And animal agriculture produces more than plant agriculture. So that is clear. Um, and it's also clear how much it is, you know, what the total amounts are. I think it's important to own this, say, we understand this is part of a societal concern. We have quantified, we have enumerated what our contributions are, and we have pledged further reductions, and they are quantifiable. This 25% reduction, for example, here in California, 25% reduction of methane has been certified by the state of California. And now that dairy industry out there can say, look, we are not just saying it, we are doing it. And we want to be part of a solution. And, and we're doing that on top of producing all the food that you all enjoy. Because let's, let's face it, the vast majority of people in our countries love animal source foods. They love their barbecue and their bacon and their eggs and their dairy products and so on. But they want to be assured that they are produced in a way, these products are produced in a way that's responsible environmentally in every respect. And so it is your role to show that you are responsible, that you quantify what your impacts are and further reduce. So we have our next question here. Given the global emission figures of what uh, IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, often quote in the media, what percent of the agriculture emissions are livestock generated methane? And are these actually calculated fairly? Because I did, and I have seen some studies that say it's as much as 14%. And uh, just, uh, I guess, your comments around that. So please know that the Canadian numbers, the California, the US numbers are very different from these global numbers. Okay. So in your country or mine, it's around 5%, a little less than 5% that livestock contributes. Globally, the average is high 14, that's one, four, 14.5%. The reason is that three quarters of all countries in the world are developing countries in which there are very large livestock herds. And in these countries, they have relatively small fossil fuel sectors, making the global average look large. And then those people who are critical of animal agriculture always use the global numbers to tell your citizens why they should not consume animal source foods. Why don't they use Canadian numbers? You tell me that. Exactly. I've I've, I've come into those conversations quite a bit. Um, is it true that you can reduce the amount of methane released from a cow by feeding it a ration with canola meal? I think the canola farmers probably put that in the uh, questions here. Uh, I don't know about canola meal, but I can tell you that we have uh, tested about almost 100 feed additives. And of the 190 something don't work, they don't reduce methane, enteric methane but about 10 of them do and five of them do really well and we are now seeing reductions anywhere between 10 to 50 percent possible um, with respect to reducing enteric emissions and enteric emissions make up the lion's share of methane from from all of agriculture okay enteric emission is what's belched out we can reduce it and it will be convert uh, commercially available within the next few years the question is can we pay for that and how do we pay for that? And how can we incentivize that? Yeah. Um, another quick question, and I'm not too sure we touched on it exactly, but what about the transportation of food? Uh, is that considered an agriculture emission or is that considered a transportation emission? It always depends on whether you only look at direct emissions or at life cycle emissions. If you look at life cycle emissions, um, if you want to know what the carbon footprint of a pound of beef is, uh, then you do what's called an LCA, a life cycle assessment. And that looks at the cradle to grave emission profile of that pound of beef, including everything from soils to crops, to feed, to animals, to transportation of all the food and so on to the consumer. And then uh, finally us eating it. I mean, that's cradle to grave. Um, the transportation portion of the total impact of animal source foods is very small. It's not large, it's very small. And the reason is that our transportation choices are so efficient. If you look at a semi truck and how we fill that thing, if you look at a train or at a, at a container ship or something like this, uh, the emissions per unit of product that are associated with transportation are a small proportion. The number one is enteric emissions. And the number two is animal manure. 
Okay, so we have time for one last question. Uh, what's the status of the cattle herd growth in Canada and the United States? Uh, are, hit, are herds still growing to meet the global demand for beef or are we missing that? Uh, I have not seen the numbers for Canada, but I've, uh, I have communicated with some colleagues from Canada who have told me that if you use the GWP star calculation for Canada and you look at your inventories and you look at what your methane has done over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, that your methane has gone down. Not been stable, not gone up, that your methane has gone down. And you know what happens when methane goes down. If I were you, if I were your industry, if I were uh, a scientist in Canada, I would be very interested in enumerating uh, what the methane has, the methane picture has looked like over the last few decades and what that means to your overall carbon footprint. I bet that the current numbers using this old GWP 100 numbers are very different from those predicted by this new method, GWP star. Awesome, excellent. Well, I wanted to thank you very much and, and we have a standing ovation. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I have to do every time my Niners uh, lose. I got to play that back for myself just to make sure that uh, somebody actually is cheering for them anymore. Is, is this how you wake up in the morning? You just push yeah. that button? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's how I get going. I did want to thank you very much again. A very thought-provoking uh, topic. Uh, and I think a lot of people are, are very interested in that here in Canada. And, and we hope one day uh, to have you up here to Saskatchewan so uh, you can give a, a live talk too. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Same to you. All the best to you. Bye-bye.